Well, good afternoon, folks. I welcome you to the Missouri Department of Conservation's wild webcast on gardening for backyard wildlife with the birds and bees and butterfly weed, bringing nature to your landscape. We have a bunch of folks still tuning in. So if you're just joining us, um, we're gonna get going here. Thanks to everybody for joining us. My name is Joe Jarek and I'll be your host today. We'd like to welcome our topic expert, Aaron Shanks, who is an urban wildlife biologist with our Powder Valley Nature Center in the St. Louis area. So good afternoon, Aaron. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Joe, I'm happy to be here. And we are happy to have you. So again, today, we're talking about attracting backyard wildlife, and we will be sharing a lot of information, but also welcome questions. So folks, if you have some questions, please share your questions through the chat box on the right side of your webcast screen, and we will try to address those questions as much as possible during the hour we have. So again, share your questions through the chat box and we're gonna jump right in. So Aaron, a big part of attracting backyard wildlife is creating habitat. And what's exactly habitat? Yeah, we're gonna start right there at the very basic level of what, what do we mean by habitat in, in our backyards? And that's the food, water, cover, and space that an animal needs to live and reproduce. And so most of our wildlife that we find throughout the state actually don't require a tremendous amount of space. Uh, of course, we do have species that require, you know, uh, hundreds of square miles, if not more, but many of our animals, such as insects or small mammals, um, can really live out quite uh, their entire life cycle in a small amount of space, finding that food, water, cover uh, that they need to live and reproduce. Well, okay, and we're going to get into more of our backyard neighbors, but essentially when we're talking uh, birds, bees, butterflies, and small mammals like squirrels, voles, moles, things like that, um, we could find those in urban, suburban, or rural habitat, and we're going to get into that. So when yep. we talk about habitat, quality habitat is what it's all about. Why don't you tell us more and the couple of pictures of yards? Yep. Um, so we always talk about native plants. This is a theme you will hear over and over again when we're, whenever we're talking about improving habitat quality. Um, and here you can really see the distinct difference between the plant diversity that is offered to potential wildlife on those properties from the sort of monoculture turf grass there, which is a more traditional lawn, to uh, a, a real diverse array of grasses and wildflowers and shrubs at that second picture. And native plants really provide the highest quality of habitat, um, and that is because of their relationships with insects. So insects throughout Missouri, which we have uh, about 25,000 species wow. um, yeah, of native insects, they have real specific relationships with these native plants. Right, and as we look at those photographs, I mean, you know, everybody loves that pretty green lawn, but the sad reality is that's a desert. It might it be, sure great, but it's still a desert when it comes to wildlife and all those key pollinators. And then that native planting yard, that's really an oasis in comparison. So as we look at that, um, native plants and insects, a lot of folks uh, worry about kind of their garden and hey, stuff's eating my plants. What do we have? Right. So as I said, with you know, nine out of ten of our twenty-five thousand species of insects in Missouri rely on native plants, um, especially when they're in the larval stage. So when they're in that caterpillar stage, and ultimately, if your habitat project isn't promoting insect health and diversity, it's really kind of a failed enterprise as far as habitat goes. Um, I really like this uh, garden sign here, if you want to flash that up there, but um, it's a good reminder that as we garden for wildlife, we want our gardens to be part of the food web and part of the ecosystem. And so things eating your plants, while sometimes those can cause pest problems, in general, a healthy ecosystem will have its own checks and balances in place. Right, and one of those great examples, um, the iconic monarch butterfly, 
when it's in its caterpillar stage, it eats exclusively milkweed plants. Yeah. So if you're yeah. growing milkweed and you see caterpillars crunching on the leaves, please let those be. That is essential for our monarch butterfly. So that's just one example. And also okay. native plants really are incredibly important for hosting native insects, such as caterpillars. So as we look at the lists on this slide, um, why don't you tell us a little a quick comparison? Yeah, so here you see a real striking difference between our native plants and the kind of uh, the volume of caterpillar species that can eat those uh, the leaves or the uh, the plant tissue of those species versus some of our more populous uh, invasive plants and native plants. And really, my favorite one to point out is you know look at. Um, the, the oak trees compared to the butterfly bush, which is a very poorly named um, <laughs> ornamental bush that we we think when we put it all in with the name butterfly bush that is going to support all sorts of butterflies, and of course it does not. Um, right, those. Whereas, oh, yeah. Oh, whereas the oak trees and cherry, walnut, and, and most of our forbs as well are are or wildflower plants, herbaceous wildflower plants, will support dozens if not hundreds of different kinds of species. Right, those numbers right there are really pretty amazing. Hundreds yeah. and hundreds of different species of caterpillars on our native plants versus relatively few, if any, on these introduced. They're not necessarily invasive, but they're introduced in many ways. So, you know, be they invasive or introduced. Um, Let's see, Pat already wants to know, and thank you, Pat, are there any milk types of milkweed plants that are not fit for monarchs? No, anything in that genus Asclepius is the, um, is the, the, the Latin term, the um, taxonomic genus of milkweeds, and they can feed on anything in that genus. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Pat. So as we're talking about all these caterpillars, and a lot of people are probably like, ick, I don't want all these bugs, but they are incredibly important to support our other backyard wildlife. So tell us more yes. about that. Yeah, so so this gets into why, if you, if you want to garden for backyard wildlife, why this really matters, is that so much of the rest of our life within our ecosystem depends on those insects, especially in that larval stage, one of the kind of famous examples is one nest of chickadees, um, which typically has about six babies in it. And is that um, what we're seeing here? Um, and there, there is a chickadee there on the left. Yes. Okay. And and um, one nest of chickadees, which takes about 16 days to raise them from the time that they hatch to the time that they leave the nest, they will consume together 9,000 caterpillars. Okay. Per nest. Let's let's just make sure we got that right. So one yeah. nest of about a half a dozen baby chickadees, parents will bring them nine thousand caterpillars. You heard that right. Another insect. Wow. <laughs> That's again. If yeah. you want birds in your backyard, you need the bugs. You do. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. And you know, like songbirds, there are other backyard friends we have that rely on insects for protein and fat and nutrients. So why don't you tell us? Real quick, who are our, some of our backyard friends? I mean, pretty much every taxonomic group. So every group of animals that um, are going to rely on larval insects in particular at some point in their life. Um, and so that includes, you know, frogs and toads and um, other reptiles, turtles, of course, um, snakes, spiders. Um, and bats. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. And many of our mammals will also feed on insects. And that larval stage in particular, I know I keep mentioning caterpillars and larval insects. One of the reasons why they're so important is that they are so full of fat and energy, but also because they're easy to catch and eat and easy to bring back to young in a nest. Okay, good to know. So if you want to support backyard wildlife, you need to support the backyard bugs. Um, yep, and the best way to do that is native plants. Native plants. So let's meet uh, a few more of our neighbors. Yep. So when we're talking about backyard wildlife, just kind of touch on some of the main groups that that we like to see in our backyards. First, mammals um, are really the easiest, kind of largest to identify. So groundhogs, um, moles, and shrews. You see a little shrew there. Um, and mice, of course, we think of those as a pest species, but really we have 20 species of mice, rats, and voles in Missouri that are native um, and part of the an important part of the food web. 
Um, our, our larger, more um, kind of uh, uh, you noted. know, funded, yeah, noted. Um, the red fox and the the coyote. Coyotes are well established in urban areas all throughout North America. At this point, it's not uncommon to see them at all. And then my favorite, I had to put a picture on here of the possum because that is my favorite Missouri mammal, and it's our only awesome. marsupial. Yeah, the awesome right. possum. Right. So we want to welcome these neighbors to our backyards usually because they help really create the larger ecosystem. But folks also want you to know, yes, we know some of them can cause some damage. Groundhogs, for example. So if you have any of these critters, groundhogs, coyote issues, things like that, we have some staff who can help with um, wildlife damage control. And we also have more information on wildlife damage control on our website. So just visit mdc.mo.gov and use the search tool at the top to search groundhog damage or coyote, nuisance coyotes or things like that. And we can help you with those problems. But overall, we want these to be welcome friends on our landscape. Um, That's right. And a key part of, of all of this too, birds, 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 birds. So tell oh, us a bit yeah. about the birds that we may see. Well, in general, um, you know, we, we see about 400 different types of birds, different species of birds in Missouri throughout the year. Um, some of them are here year round, so they're really residents, like the, um, the cardinal. Other birds uh, just, just come up here for the warmer months, and this is where they breed and raise their young before they migrate. And typically they're migrating to Central America, um, sometimes all the way to South America, uh, Dominican Republic, Cuba, the, some of those Caribbean islands. And then we have birds that migrate through. So they make an even longer migration and go from those southern territories that I just mentioned all the way farther north, sometimes all the way up to the Arctic even. Okay, so, so we have about 150 species of birds who come into Missouri for nesting and raising their young, 60 that just pass through. Um, mm -hmm. Another one of those kind of iconic birds um, is the hummingbird, for example. They have an incredible migration route and they may be in Missouri throughout the year, but they also leave and then come back. And another one is the monarch butterfly, for example. Um, it has an incredible migration route down through the uh, United States into South Central America. So birds, butterflies, other things really need um, some good habitat while they're here. The next picture, right. one of our most beautiful birds. Why don't you tell us about that and then we'll see its migration. Yeah, so this is the indigo bunting. It's a really fun one to spot. They're very iridescent, so they almost look like they shimmer in the sun when you when you see them because of that very, very distinct blue. Um, they also have a really fun call. It sounds like they're singing, fire, fire, put it out, fire, fire, put it out. It's one of my favorite ones, and I've been hearing them all week this week, so they are back um, from their southern territories, and um if you there's a there's a really neat bird citizen science bird research tool called eBird and anyone can participate in it and um, log the sightings of, of the birds they see. If you want to play that video there, there should be a little uh, play button there. Um, you we can see the movement of these birds throughout the year. You can see those colors change wow. and how they move. Yep, and so, so and the then they go all the way back down. Okay. And that's a common, that is a common migratory bird. So it overwinters down there in Central America and the dense rainforest of Central America. And then it comes back to our backyards to breed and raise its young, which I just think is and then it heads the back. coolest. That is amazing. And all of those long flights take an incredible amount of energy. And again, a great source of energy are those larval insects, caterpillars and things. So They're absolutely essential for these little guys to make that journey, uh, it, yeah, which is a, which is an amazing physical feat to think of that something is, that's bar barely half an ounce that flies across a continent. Right. So this is just the migratory route for the indigo bunting. This website has migratory routes for just about every bird, right? Yes, it does. I mean, it's a really neat website to explore, and you can participate in the collection of that data, too. So we encourage folks to do that. Okay. So this website, um, how do folks find it? eBird. Um, so just type in ebird.org. Okay, thank you.
That mm -hmm. is amazing. And again, thanks again, Pat, for your question. If anybody else has questions, please share them through the chat box. Um, we have another question. Um, is there a, such a tropical milkweed? Mm -hmm. and you I know, know I've would, never... Yeah, it wouldn't be native yeah. to Missouri, but... No, I wouldn't be. And I don't know if there, you know, a common name of that. Um, I'm not familiar with with the common name of that, but um, we don't have one in Missouri that is typically called that. Okay. All right. So as we're talking neighbors, you know, birds and mammals and things, we have some other neighbors that people might initially be a, afraid of or, or not like, but they too are incredibly, incredibly important. So let's talk a bit more about amphibians and reptiles. Yeah, um, snakes in particular, of course, notoriously get a bad rap, but they're in incredibly important and beneficial to have on the landscape. They eat quite a few insects, um, and oftentimes the larger-bodied insects that we find less pleasant, like, you know, roaches or um, grasshoppers that, you know, might might eat our plants. So these, uh, some of the common ones to see in our backyards are the garter snake or the rat snake. And I wanted to point out that many of our juvenile snakes have different patterns on them than they do as adults. And so they can often be mistaken for venomous snakes simply because somebody sees a diamond-shaped or a striped pattern on a snake. That does not mean that it is a venomous snake. Right. And, and to build on that a little bit, the juvenile black rat snake, we get a lot of questions on that. What is this? Because when they, by its name, black rat snake, they should be large mm -hmm. and all black. But again, right. as you said, when they're younger, they have a very different pattern and people may mistake them for um, copperheads or things like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we advise you kind of get to know your snakes. And if you see them in your landscape, in your garden, they're incredibly valuable. So, you know, leave them be if at all possible. Yeah, I mean, really, the, the if you leave them alone, they're going to leave you alone. Exactly. Um, we we don't recommend trying to pick them up, and exactly. if you're not trying leave to do that, leave. they're not going to be a problem. Yeah. Right. And, another, and then, of course, turtles, turtles. and toads. Yeah, <laughs> turtles. Every, everyone loves the turtle. Uh, do I? And um, turtles, you know, we we just discourage you from moving from moving them. Enjoy them. They um they eat insects, especially when they're young, and then they tend to eat more fruit and plant material as they age. But um. Turtles will go underground in the winter, so if you see a box turtle around your house in the warmer months and then you don't see it for a while over over the cooler uh, months of the year and then you start seeing it again, it probably is that same box turtle. I mean, they can live 30 years um, in the wild. So, right. it, and um, yeah, so, so they can get up there in age and you can enjoy that same box turtle year after year. Right, and just as an aside, folks, um, sometimes people think it's fun and cute to maybe paint the shells on the box turtle they find in the yard. We really encourage you not to do that as a form of identification because that can have really negative consequences on the turtle. They, their shells are live um, growing mm -hmm. tissue and things like that. So please don't paint the turtles. Um, and yeah. toads and frogs, they're common residents in a lot of backyards. Again, eat a ton yep. of insects, including mosquitoes and things. So we'll get into that a bit more. Um, yep, they certainly do. And Sandy wants to know where you can buy native bushes and flowers. We're going to get into that a little bit later. So we will talk about some sources. Yeah, um, we'll definitely get her some resources. But as we move on, one of our most important, sometimes feared and often underappreciated neighbors are native bees. They're right. amazing. And I know you and I both love them. Tell us more. Yeah, so when we think about bees, oftentimes what we're thinking of is the honeybee, but the honeybee is actually not native. It is incredibly important for agricultural purposes, but um, we have 254 native species of bees in the state of Missouri. Two, um, many of those, wait, two, 254, okay. yep. That is amazing, yep. and that's out of like 600 species in North America of native bees? Yeah, there's yeah, there's quite a bit more throughout North America, but just in Missouri, you know, we've got quite a few native bee species, and they um, they're everything from large-bodied bumblebees and leafcutter mason bees um, to the very beautiful kind of very recognizable uh, green sweat bee, that metallic green sweat bee there that um, you see in the picture. Can you? Uh, it's a real fun one to watch. Can you tell us who all of these little friends are? 
are if we start in the top yeah, and left. I might, I might have them, if you click it one more time, they might be labeled with their family names, but um, we have... Um, but the common names. The, oh, yeah. The, so there they are. So the, the mast bees are those coletids, um, and they are small ground nesting bees. In the top um, center. The, and then there's the, the slut bees, of course, in... It's not all of them are pretty green, you know, iridescent colors like that, but is, okay, those, so that one is easy to find. The top right is a sweat bee. Mm -hmm. And then we've got some bumblebees below that. Those are everybody's favorite to watch, those big, slow, uh, kind of panda of the, of the bee right. world. <laughs> the distinct black and yellow. Um, in addition, yep. so bumblebees, and what we could talk about this, I think, uh, in a, a bit more, but in addition to all of these bees, some real key bees that you find in your landscape, hopefully, are those solitary bees. So are we going to talk mm -hmm. about that later, or should we talk about mason bees, leafcutter bees? Yeah, so, oh, no, let's talk about that now. I think that's a great point is um, most of our bees, so other than bumblebees, we have very few social bees in Missouri that are native. So most of these are solitary, which means they're really not aggressive. Um, it, it means that they are not defending a hive that they, when they lay eggs, they actually provision every single one of those young. So they're not laying thousands and thousands of eggs like we think of with a lot of insect species. Like that in a big hive, like. right. Right, and um, they are laying typically closer to, you know, 10 to 30 young a year. And then they are storing food in that nest for each one of those young, which is a pretty incredible effort. Right, so if we, to help break it down, and again, folks, Google solitary bees, mason bees, they are amazing, and they're amazing moms, because each female solitary bee, a mason bee, leaf cutter bee, for example, they will find a tubular burrow, they will place one egg in there, and then a pollen sac to feed that egg, and then seal that up, and repeat it kind of down the line where there's, you know, a half a dozen individual eggs or so in each of these kind of tubular nests. And those, those mama mason bees do that throughout their entire brief life in the summer. So if, if you see them, give them, a, give them some applause and leave them alone. Yep. Okay, so bees are incredibly important neighbors. And we're going to talk more later as far as the role in pollination they play. But we have yeah. some other neighbors who think people might think them are a little creepy, but they're incredibly valuable. Right. Back to, back to insects and spiders and mm -hmm. um, crustaceans and whatnot. And we've already talked about the 25,000 species of insects that we have in Missouri. Um, we've got also 300 spider species that, that have been identified. And who knows, we, may, we very likely have more species of that, of the spiders in Missouri. Um, well, the, the reality is that, yeah. Well, let's um, focus on the one we see, the big yellow garden spiders. Now, Th those are fun ones, I think. I mean, they are big, though. They are big, and a lot of times- <laughs> Very conspicuous. And even you may walk out your front door and see this large nest and see this big spider hanging there and freak out. Don't. <laughs> the key thing to take away, they're not interested in us. They're non-venomous to us. They're non-aggressive, mm -hmm. leave them be, they're incredibly valuable. So we just enjoy it. I always enjoy I, them. I they're, think yeah. They're fascinating watch to them. watch. Yeah. So mm -hmm. a lot of spiders, even you know, um, the crane flies and these other insects that might look like mosquitoes, they're not. They're important because they're important food. Yep, and, and crane flies are a good example. Not only do they get mistaken for mosquitoes a lot, which is too bad, but they're, um, they are a good example of how important insects are as food because they're semi-aquatic. So in their larval or young stage, they are in our kind of slower moving streams and, um, and rivers, and they're a really important uh, food source for fish and other aquatic life. Right. Might people also find these if they have a small backyard pond or you know sure. a bit of a stagnant water source that's not yeah i just have a i have a low wet spot in my yard and we get crane flies out of there okay which is neat. so as you mm -hmm. see these again they're a valuable part of the backyard landscape mm -hmm. and Aaron, not everything happens above the soil what goes on below the soil is i mean literally the foundation 
for your backyard you, planting. So why don't you share a bit more about subterranean life? Yeah, I mean, as gardeners, I think we probably think a little bit more about soil health than the average person, but um, it's really remarkable when you start to imagine the amount of life that that is present in that soil. So um, one teaspoon of soil can have thousands of nematodes in, um, in there and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of algae spores and amoeba, fungal spores and bacteria. And all of these have specific relationships also to our plant roots. So it's important to have that diversity of life below the ground so that the roots can develop and pull nutrients from the um, non-living matter of the soil. And so that soil also, and those roots underground also provide carbon sequestration. So they store carbon dioxide. And um, and that's, of course, a really important um, service that they bring or that the, that the that healthy soil can bring to us. Right. And, and another important note for the backyard gardeners, you know, by amending or improving your soil through natural things such as compost, leaf litter, mm -hmm. that real um, local, often free organic matter, that's going to really build soil health and create this amazing ecosystem. It also may save you money on fertilizers and things like that. If you create really good, rich soil, you don't need to fertilize your plants as much. That's exactly right. right. Yep. And leaf litter, I'm glad you mentioned that one. We'll talk about that one a little more later. Okay. Um, we got some more questions. Kind of general, but is there like a native cover crop for some green spaces? There's probably a lot of them, and we could just recommend the source maybe. Yep. Um, and we'll definitely talk about where to find specific recommendations for okay. your specific needs um, in, in, a, in just a little bit. Okay. Um, we do have another quick question. As far as bee boxes, um, you could get a lot of information, folks, online as far as building your own, buying them, things like that. And somebody wants to know a good place to put them. Right. Um, yeah. So if you're going to put out some artificial nesting boxes for bees, the best place to put them is um, somewhere at least three feet off the ground um, and kind of facing the um, facing west, if, if at all possible, with some sun, sun exposure. Right. Because the bee boxes, what those bees want, they want some sun to warm the boxes, but not brutal midday sun to roast them. So if right. you're going to mm -hmm. put a bee box out, put it in a location that gets what morning sun. Yeah, um, you know, morning or afternoon, it, it's it, it'll just not all day. Right. Um, they're not they're not incredibly picky, so right. you don't it, it, you know it. When we talk about some other nesting boxes like bat boxes, mm -hmm. those can be much harder to get residents to take up. But bees generally, if you put them out. Um, and there's a fairly wide range of what they will accept and invest in. Okay, so thank you. Um, and thank you folks for your questions. And as we kind of let's expand, let's grow this a bit more from a specific kind of structure to the entire design and planning for your backyard wildlife. And I know there's a lot of information here, so let's kind of jump in and then recommend some more sources. Yeah. The, the best place to start. So you, you want to take into account those big things that you have, like any kind of power lines or underground utilities, certainly before you dig any holes or um, don't plant a large or like a white oak tree under a power line because that's going to be a problem in the future. So you want to think about those kinds of things. Of course, we encourage people to use the 1-800-DIG-RIGHT before they would dig any holes um, in order to mark underground utilities. And then just pay attention to site conditions. So throughout the year, but also throughout the day during the growing season. So where's your morning sun versus afternoon sun? Afternoon sun tends to be a lot more drying as the, um, as the atmosphere heats up. Um, do you have low spots and wet spots? And you can utilize those site conditions to that and actually have plants that need those and benefit from those, um, from those site conditions rather than you see folks sometimes battling site conditions. They want to be able to grow a specific plant in a specific place rather than kind of select the plants for that place. Um, bloom times, we really encourage you to think about three seasons of blooms. Um, so early spring and late fall in particular have slimmer pickings as far as what is available, but having 
flowers that are blooming at those times at those times can be really important for our early and late kind of nesting insects in particular. Right, and, and, and then yeah, so with bloom time, I think. Folks, you need to do some research when you're selecting your plants and seeing what season, because most perennials, you know, the joy of planting annuals is that you get flowers all season. Now, the benefit of, one of the benefits of perennials is you don't have to plant them every year. Every year they get kind of bigger and better. And over time, you could even divide some and share with your friends and neighbors. The mm -hmm. limit is that most perennials have a bloom time of what, about six or eight weeks? Yeah. So you wanna be able to space that bloom time throughout your garden so you have something in bloom all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you were mentioning structure. Yep, and so just thinking about where your taller plants are, especially in a flower garden, you know, you wanna think about your taller plants in back and, um, and your shorter plants in front and where the sun is coming is, is, you know, how the sun moves across the sky so that you, those, Smaller plants aren't shading out the smaller growing ones. Right, and, and regarding structure too, we might talk about this more, but folks, when you're putting in native plants, perennials, don't do a little onesie, twosie, threesie. Most perennial plants like to have the same plants around them and most pollinators will benefit from that too. So when you're putting in perennials, think of groups of the same plant. That's gonna help attract more pollinators. For sure. Okay, and then also in this image, um, soil conditions. Have your soil tested. I know in my yard, it's mostly clay, so I have to amend it a lot. But is it peaty, sandy, loamy, clay, chalky, or silty? So kind of test your soil and get a better idea of the soil conditions, and that way it helps put the right plant in the right place. And Missouri Extension is available to help with that. Right, wonderful. So thank you with that. And another great source because you could create so many garden designs. It, it's just kind of overwhelming. So let's talk about planning and designing and all the choices and what's our best resource for that. Really it's Grow Native. And if you take one thing away from this, you know, I hope that you remember GrowNative.org because we could go over uh, several hundred different species of native plants that are commercially available for backyards um, and what those conditions would be. But the great news is that in Missouri, we have the Grow Native um, website as a resource. It is native specific, native specifics to Missouri. And there are um, vendors on there. You can see where to buy those throughout the state. You can put in your conditions on your landscape and it will generate suggestions for you depending on what your goals are and what, you know, what you've got um, as far as space and site conditions. I mean, it's just an incredible resource. So don't, you know, don't worry too much about having to, to do all that research on your own. Grow Native is truly kind of a one stop shop in Missouri for that information. I just want to second that. Um, I love the website. And again, GrowNative.org. Uh, somebody asked early where to get some native plants. Grow Native, they have an amazing resource guide, as Aaron said, mm -hmm. to find um, local um, sellers of native plants throughout the state. Like you said, a ton of different garden designs, background on different native plants, their needs, all of that. So one of the best things you could do is grow to go to grownative.org. That's right. And and I want to add too that these are regularly these plant selection or plant um, recommendations are regularly uh, evaluated. So th this is something that as we learn more about native plants and as more native plants become commercially available, we can add them and are adding them to these to this grow native website. So um, so it is regularly updated and evaluated. Yeah, and there's some amazing selections. Even as I look through this example, I have a, a number of these and and yeah, they're amazing. And then building up mm -hmm. from our native flowers and shrubs and things, you know, kind of if the, the soil is the foundation, trees are really the ultimate structure in a landscape. So let's talk about trees. Yeah. Trees, I, I, we like to think of trees as actually like infrastructure. Right, um, right. It's kind of part, part of the infrastructure of our homes and communities. And of course it is, um, 
important in that they provide shade and capture carbon and um, help manage stormwater. But again, getting back to what we were talking about as far as insect health and um, diversity, they're absolutely critical for uh, for diversity of wildlife as well. Right, as you said, now, planting a tree, though, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, we mentioned earlier, our native oak trees, they support literally more than 500 different species of caterpillar. So, yeah. you know, not just oak trees, but planting native trees is really um, an amazing way. And during April, we celebrate Arbor Days. So this Yay. is still, you still have time to get out and plant a native tree and just really, mm -hmm. really help it all. So I love yeah. the quote here. Oh, yes, that's one of my favorites, too. The The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. So, you know, yes. I I tell myself that, you know, each year and I've been able to get a few trees in the ground myself. Oh, yeah. And, and one of my favorite quotes is, wise is the man who plants a tree under which he will never sit. Because yeah. when we plant trees, it's not just for us, but literally for future generations, because some of these trees live hundreds of years. So that mm -hmm. is amazing. I, you know, I just want to add a, a tip, folks. I put in about a half a dozen trees this month also for Arbor Day. And when you plant trees, give them time. One of another old kind of saying is when you go to plant a tree, the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. And what we mean by that, you plant a tree the first year up top above ground, it's not going to do much because it's putting all of its energy into its root development. And then by that second year, it has some root development and you'll see some top growth. So that's kind of that year that it just creeps along. But by the third year, the roots should be well developed and your trees will just take off, providing you plant the right tree in the right place, which is vital. So remember, right. first year it sleeps, second year it creeps, third year it leaps. Very good. All right, and as we said, oak trees, they capture carbon, they help manage stormwater, support a bunch of bugs through the food web. Mm -hmm. That's yep. amazing. And, uh, and you've already mentioned this, but leaf litter also is incredibly important for soil health. Well, right, and that's, you know, we also have an obsession, some folks, with that perfectly green manicured lawn, and then we have to remove all the leaves. Actually, it's incredibly beneficial to leave your leaves throughout the year, unless they're matted to the point they'll kill your lawn, but some leaves, and especially in your gardens, leave all that leaf litter on, from fall through spring because beneficial bugs live in that. That breaks down and creates incredible soil health. Um, and fallen leaves, really, they're free, too. So if you want to save some <laughs> money, collect your leaves, mulch them, and use them to create compost. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Robert wants to know, does he need to worry about pets eating milkweed? Well, aphids, of course, can um, oftentimes will do a number oh, on. Pets. I'm sorry, not pests, pets. Like, pets. you know, it's oh, a dog okay. or a cat or, you know, they're really not going to be attracted to it. So you don't really yeah, have to. Yeah, they have a, I mean, not that I tasted it, but my understanding it has a very bitter taste. Right. Um, so you wouldn't want them to eat it, but um, I don't think that most animals would find that attractive. Okay. And then Ken wants to know plants to repel deer, rabbits, chipmunks, etc. And I'd say again, Grow Native has great information on some plants that are deer resistant, for example. Yes, they do. So um, again, that there is a fact sheet um, and a top ten list of that are less palatable to deer um, on that Grow Native website. And that, that again, is evaluated each year. But deer in particular are, um, I mean, they can digest just about any plant material. So they're ruminants, just like a cow. If you, if you think of a, like a chambered stomach, that's what they have. So they're going to... There really is no such plant that is truly deer resistant, um, but they do seem to exhibit some uh, preference to things like like anything in the lily family, for example. Okay. Um, they will go after. If you do live in an area with a lot of deer and you want to plant mm -hmm. trees, it's best to put some protective fencing around them for the first decade. Right. Okay. Um, and also, 
Uh, Bambi wants to know how to eradicate winter creeper without chemicals. We're going to touch upon some selective spraying later in this webcast. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, winter creeper is a bugger one, I tell you. Um, but pulling it, of course, and you have to be, it, it, it's going to be nonstop. So you're going to be battling it forever, but that's okay. You can definitely make progress. Pulling it is one of the best non-chemical ways. You can um, try to solarize it, so cover it with um, plastic and it burn it. essentially, yeah. yeah, essentially like starve it of light. Okay. Um, and it, it has to stay on there for quite a while, but it, that's not, that's another way you can try to address winter creeper. Okay, here's one out of the blue. Peter wants to know: Are you familiar with Robin's plantain? No, I'm not. Okay, and he wants to know if it's yeah. good for any specific insect. But okay. planting uh, anything that flowers is going to attract bees, for example. So plantain, I know, is a, is a popular kind of weed. I think it's also okay. edible, though. Yeah. If you want to look into well, that. Is it also is it also fleabane? Do people call it is fleabane called Robin's plantain? Maybe. We're, yeah. we're checking. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure what kind of insects that would support, but um, fleabane, absolutely. I mean, you see insects on on that from flies to small bees, for sure. Okay. okay, so as we're talking plant selection, as we're selecting plants, let's get into some key things about that. Yeah, so when you're thinking about plant selection, it's good to think about different types of flowers. So that's what I mean by structure is different, different kinds of flowers and different flower shapes and different colors. Um, will you'll enjoy that for one thing but also that provides forage for different types of insects so um, variety yeah variety uh planting groups you've already mentioned this joe but right. you're absolutely right we you keep like species together pollinators actually prefer to visit the same type of flower over and over and over until they've exhausted that pollen source um, and that benefits the plant as well so that there's plenty of cross-pollination happening. Um, we've, we've talked about considering three seasons of blooms in particular, trying to find some things that'll bloom early and bloom late. And then I really, I remind people like it's okay to have <laughs> some limitations and, and to be honest about what you're capable with. And um, I say this mostly because I'm at fault more than, more than anyone probably of getting so excited every spring that I just want to bite off a gigantic project and then um, and then feel tired and frustrated. When it's not as perfect <laughs> as you imagine. Oh, I, I have the yeah. same feeling. So little bits at a time and learn as you go. And that is, um, that's kind of a winning strategy. Right. And for newbie gardeners, I just want to let you know too, planting natives. It's incredibly helpful as we're talking about today, but sometimes people think, oh, I'm going to plant perennials native perennials, and then boom, my work is done. No garden is without work. So keep yeah. in mind, kind of, and just go with the level that you're willing and able to commit. So um, we have about 15 minutes left, folks. Again, we welcome your questions. As we move through here, we're talking native landscape. Tell, let's go into back into what makes a healthy lawn. Yeah, so, I mean, lawns are probably our biggest kind of struggle with regards to backyard gardening. The turf grass does serve a purpose. I mean, it can withstand the kind of foot traffic that no other real ground cover can, um, but trying to minimize what that, the, the space that that turf grass takes up to really those spaces that you want to use for that purpose. Um, but also just leaving the weeds. So killing off broadleaf weeds in turf grass is a pretty arbitrary thing to do. Um, those weeds like clover and dandelion and violet um, are really important forage for pollinators. Many of those violets are native too and dandelions have been long established right. here. Um, so even some of those non-native broadleaf, you know, what we think of as lawn weeds are actually important if you can just leave those. And um, certainly minimizing fertilizer. I mean, fertilizer, much of that just gets washed right off the, your, uh, your lawn and into our local waterways, which, um, can which be is quite not harmful. good for them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so and then slowing, slowing how much you mow. So if you can mow every other week instead of every week, that can actually have quite a big impact on um, especially bees that, that visit your yard because you do allow some of those broadleaf um, flowering plants to grow up 
to a couple inches tall and produce a flower. Right, and to build on that, and folks, the takeaway with this too, is in the spring, if you can delay your initial mowing or set your mower higher, because in the spring, when we see those first violets or our um, dandelions or the clover, as you mentioned, um, or the um, spring beauty, which is the little white pink star shaped tiny flowers in the lawn, mm -hmm. that is often the first and only available food for early pollinators. So if you leave that in your yard, you're really literally saving those pollinators lives in that early spring before other things bloom. So keeping yep. that in mind. And we actually have a, we have a bee in Missouri that's quite common that is an obligate of spring beauty. So it is the only pollen it can feed to its young. Um, it's a, it's an Arginii, it's a mining bee and it emerges real early when spring beauty is blooming and um, it, it requires spring beauty pollen to feed its young. That's amazing. Um, we have a question yeah. from Susan. She wants to know some of the best annuals to plant for pollinators. And I just want to jump in here, Erin, and say there are a ton of different types of flowers. So what we ask people to do is, again, maybe go to Grow Native or go online to see what types of flowers um, attract different pollinators. Hummingbirds, for example, and some butterflies need long tubular flowers to drink the nectar out of. So it really depends. That's a huge question, Susan. Um, so I'd really ask if you kind of do some research on what annuals work for your space and then what types of pollinators. Yeah, and I'm interrupting. I'm sorry, Joe, but I wanted to, to, re, to restate what you said about Grow Native. Um, they do have a top 10 list of native annuals. Of um, there so we go. I'll look at that as well. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Okay, and then somebody sure. asked early about some like non chemical ways, but if you have to use chemicals, Let's give us yeah. a word about herbicides. And A, yeah. herbicides are chemicals to kill plants, whereas pesticides are chemicals to kill pests such as unwanted insects, just to be clear for folks. Right, yes. So we're not talking about killing insects here. We're talking about killing weeds um, or invasive plants, I should say, in particular. So there, I just want to make a distinction between broadcast spraying of broadleaf weed killer, like you see in that top picture, or like what lawn companies do um, and, and golf course kind of practices that is just indiscriminately going to kill anything with a broad leaf and therefore with a flower versus if you're really battling something like creeping Charlie or Euonymus or, or winter creeper um, or vine honeysuckle. Right. Yeah. And then it's spot spraying those um, very carefully <laughs> uh, because it's, Something like Roundup will kill everything that you spray it on. Um, so be very so careful. That can be helpful. And, right. Avoid yeah. windy days. So, avoid windy days. Yeah, that's very good advice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you must use herbicides, use them very sparingly and selectively only on those plants you don't want. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and we're uh, we're going to move ahead here, folks. So guard maintenance, we talked about some solitary bees. They also nest in the ground. So Aaron Wright, leave mm -hmm. some bare ground. It doesn't have to be a lot, just a little. Yep. So many of our native bees, in fact, about 70% of them nest underground. So they will build tiny tunnels. They do not harm the landscape. In fact, they're really good for the soil to have those tunnels. Um, and they will lay their eggs underground. And um, so they need some sort of access to soil in order to build those nests. And it doesn't have to be gigantic patches of bare dirt. I mean, they can, if they've got even a quarter sized right. access spot. So um, just not, just not mulching everything. Okay, so leaves <laughs> so, on the um, ground and tree mm -hmm. leaves, again, if you could avoid getting rid of them, if you have to rake them up, leave them be for a while, leave them in the bed as long as possible. And then when you have your perennials, leave those dead stems about a foot to a foot and a half tall because some insects lay their eggs in those hollow stems and you want to wait till kind of those those insects hatch and emerge. Yeah. Okay. So typically in early spring and then if you cut them try to cut them, you know, about like you said about a foot. Um as high as you can stand it. Uh, the 
the good news is that many of those insects will nest closer to the ground within the pit okay. of those stems. Um, so if you cut it, if you cut it about a foot, then the, then most of them will still be intact um, within that stem. And the garden will grow so fast, you won't even see those stems after a right. couple weeks. So, right. And, and the benefit is really big. And the benefits also to our hummingbird moth or clear wing moth mm -hmm. that we see on the left. And what is that? The IO moth on top. Yep, and, and the luna moth. The luna moth. So those also need bare ground or leaf litter to to have their larvae yeah. um, hatched and all of that. Yep, they all um, utilize leaf litter. So they will lay their eggs and um, and have their inconspicuous kind of cocoons within the leaf litter, and you wouldn't even notice them. And then, but they do rely on that leaf litter in order right. to um, to go through metamorphosis. Okay. Mm -hmm. And even leaving about, I mean, if you can stand to leave fifty percent of your leaves, right. you so know, where up. they where they lay, um, then that that is a yeah. great benefit. And one other topic that we want to touch upon, which is fascinating is companion plants with your vegetables. So yeah. if, you know, a lot of us love just not only um, plants and flowers, but also some vegetables and it's really popular. A lot of people grow tomatoes or peppers or squash and certain insects really are needed to pollinate those. So can you quickly jump right into the roles of solitary bees? Yeah, so solitary bees, as you said, are much more um, powerful pollinators and some of the sticky pollens that we find in uh, some of our favorite backyard vegetables require pollination by something that's not a honeybee, so one of our native larger bodied bees. So companion planting with native plants can really help draw them in and then so that benefits the pollinators but it also benefits us in that we will get larger and more fruit from our vegetable gardens um, because of the work of those bees. So some of my favorite ones, I, I mean, I'm a big vegetable gardener and I come from a big vegetable right. gardening family. And um, some of my favorite ones for tomatoes are um, Monarda. Monarda is great for attracting bumblebees. And what's the um, common name for Monarda? Um, bee balm. Bee balm, hence the yeah. name. So Monarda. Yeah. Others, quickly, uh, what are some other? Yeah. yeah. Uh, foxglove beard tongue, pale purple coneflower, um, wild bergamot is a great one. Um, butterfly milkweed and common milkweed are always great too. Right. So again, folks, we encourage you to do some more research, go to Grow Native and learn more as far as companion plantings because it's an entirely fascinating topic on its own. Mm -hmm. um, and moving right along here, as we're creating this habitat, a lot of times we don't need to do anything but leave things be and that will be structures. But if we want to help, um, we are talking solitary bees in that top left picture. That's a mason bee. And a lot of times they'll already find existing holes in old wood or things. But if you want to help, you can get bee boxes. And the picture below that shows nesting tubes for solitary bees. Go online, research bee, bee boxes or bee houses to learn a lot more about that. Um, that mm -hmm. other picture, the narrow blue box is a bat house. We have some um, information on how to build these on our website at mdc.mo.gov. So bat houses can attract bats, of course, and help with that. Then we have the bluebird house, which bluebirds really kind of prefer specific houses. We have designs on that. Other traditional um, bird houses, and then the communal martin houses. Uh, Martins eat an incredible amount of insects, so you can kind of find a lot of resources to get those. Yeah. Um, as far as feeding birds, um, we love birds in our backyard. If we plant a lot of correct native plants, such as coneflower, they'll eat those seeds or sunflowers. But if we want to feed birds, real quick. Yeah. Yeah, bird feeding is, can be great fun. Um, black oil sunflower is one of the most popular ones. And um, when you put that out, you'll often get cardinals and chickadees and finches. Um, sometimes even woodpeckers will come to eat the sunflower. Mixed seed is about the cheapest you can get. So that sunflower seed but has other kind of milo and, or, I'm sorry, milo and millet mixed in. Um, and that'll attract any kind of seed eater, maybe, and you might get some like European starlings and whatnot mm -hmm. that um, can be kind of a, a pest. 
But um, orange slices of the, jelly is great for attracting oh, Orioles, yeah. which are and they're here, they're this, back yes. now. So yeah, and, and then that's you a great one. Sorry, bluebird or um, uh, woodpeckers. They love suet, as you mentioned, and then bluebirds I know yeah. love mealworms. So you can buy those at a pet store or mm -hmm. whatever and put those on the ground around a bluebird box. Hummingbirds, yeah, one of the iconic. So you, if you plant native plants for hummingbirds, you don't really have to put feeders out. But if you put a feeder out, here's the recipe. Key thing is keep it clean so, so it doesn't get kind of snagged and cause problems because we mm -hmm. have some issues with um, some diseases and things. So if you're gonna feed hummingbirds, there's the recipe, keep it clean. Sorry, we're, uh, I'm gonna cruise through here a little bit, Erin. And if you sure, wanna provide no cover, brush piles, standing vegetation, native shrubs. And again, if you're gonna put out a feeder, put it close to a shrub or a tree so birds will use it because if, what, if it's way out in the open, they will see predators and, you know, a hawk or something, so they won't use it. So put your bird feeders by cover for escape. And again, if you're going to put a feeder, um, there's the issue of avian influenza going around. So can we touch quickly as far as if you put feeders out, what's going on with that bird and how to keep your feeders clean? Yeah, so uh, like you said, uh, keeping the feeders clean and the area under the feeders clean will help to deter um, disease spread. Right now, we are not seeing avian influenza in songbirds. We are seeing it in waterfowl and scavenging birds and some raptors. So, but, um, so we don't have any reason to tell people to take their feeders down at this point in time. But but keeping them clean is always important. Right, regular cleaning and yeah. feeding. That's conjunctivitis in that wren. That's a wren, right? Yeah. And it's a finch. Yeah, finch. But, um, Sorry, finch. It, yeah, it, and that's a real common one for finches, and it's often spread at feeders. Right, so it's, avoid this by keeping your feeders clean and cleaning up underneath them. We're about out of time, folks, so we thank everybody for your questions. Aaron, thank you. It's always amazing to have you. We could spend hours talking about this. I know. Thanks for having me, Joe. Well, you are welcome. What are the take, some of the takeaway points for people? Grow native, grow native, native plants, you know, native plants support native insects, and that is the kind of basis of our whole food web. Um, make use of your existing landscape features. Think about all the requirements of the habitat for the species if you're, if you're especially interested in birds, for example, or something that they might require. And then, of course, be patient. Um, any kind of habitat improvement takes time, but the rewards will make it worth it. Yes, and again, be patient because, especially when you plant natives, it takes a few years for them really to take off. But if you build it, they mm -hmm. will come, and that means pollinators and other wildlife. We mentioned uh, previously right. some online resources, Grow Native being primary and amazing. Here is a list of mm -hmm. some other ones, folks. So take a look at this, jot it down real quick as far as some online resources you might need. And Aaron, you said you love eBird and the Merlin Bird ID if you love birds. So visit eBird online. The iNaturalist app is also great for identifying wildlife. So there are some resources. And, and flowers as well. If you can take pictures yeah, of flowers, right, you can often get right. an identification. So on that is amazing. And who? Mm -hmm. I know we moved through this, but that's about it, folks. Like that squirrel, we might just be a little exhausted, but we've covered so much. So again, thank you to our topic expert, Aaron Shank, urban wildlife biologist out of Powder Valley Nature Center. And if you're in the area, in the St. Louis area, visit Powder Valley, talk to Aaron. She is just so knowledgeable and wonderful in, in general. So thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Joe. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate it. Hey, if you want more wild webcasts from MDC, again, visit us online, mdc.mo.gov, and just use the search tool and put in wild webcasts. You can see we have a variety of past webcasts, so you can learn more from that. And again, we encourage you to join us for our next wild webcast coming up at noon on May 11th. 
and that is on Missouri is bear country. So we'll be talking about be bear aware, bear hunting in Missouri, and just all things bears in Missouri. So join us on that for May 11th. You can find more information on our website. And that's a wrap, folks. Thanks for joining us for the MDC Wild webcast today. And we will catch you next time. Get outside and discover nature.